In this video, we're going to talk about principal component analysis. Um, and uh, the reason I use principal component analysis in, in, in data analysis is I'm trying to find um, those relationships in a data set. Uh, and I don't, oftentimes, whenever I'm using principal component analysis, I don't completely understand the relationships yet. I'm just kind of looking at the new data and trying to determine um, what these components may be. Okay. So let's take a look at uh, some data here. This is uh, protein data. This is from uh, several years ago. So you can see that the 25 countries that are listed here, some of the names have changed here. And in this survey, what they did was they went through and asked people in these different countries, how many grams of each of the following things did they eat uh, each day? So this is, once again, from a survey. You can see what the categories were that people ate. And the thought here is that there probably is a relationship between these different food items, okay? There probably is some sort of relationship between them. For example, countries like Albania eat a lot of cereal. If they eat a lot of cereal, what are the things that maybe they don't eat? Um, well, they don't eat very much fish. All right, so that's just one country that we're looking at. But what happens if I start trying to take this concept to a bigger level, like all of the countries that I have in this group? All right, once again, so I'm looking at relationships between each of these columns. So let's start this with correlations. You understand correlations. They, they can range from zero to positive one and all the way down to negative one. Uh, positive one means that there's an exact one-for-one one correlation between um, one item and the other item. A negative one means there's an inverse relationship. So as one goes up, the other goes down. Zero means that there's no relationship at all and things fall in between. Okay, so let's take our data. Let's go to the data tab uh, in data analysis. Uh, I can click on correlation. In correlation, I am interested in columns B through J, okay, I have B through J, and rows 1 through 26. So all of my data is collected there that I'm looking at. I have labels in my first row. This is all grouped by columns. Um, I'm ready for it to go ahead and give it to me in a new worksheet. I click OK, and it kicks out a correlation matrix for me. What the correlation matrix tells me is that from this data, that red meat only has a 0.15 correlation with white meat. So again, not a very strong relationship, but we have, you know, if you're eating red meat, if you, the more red meat you eat uh, doesn't necessarily tell you how much white meat you're eating. However, com countries that eat more red meat tend to eat more eggs, okay? Um, similarly, people who eat more white meat uh, eat more eggs. There's a stronger correlation between white meat and eggs than there is between red meat and eggs. However, you can see here that what we've done is we are beginning to look at relationships between our variables. Okay, now that we know that there are some correlations, let's go back and look at our data. Because in our data, what we're trying to do is we're saying, you know, I want to set some sort of prediction model, uh, possibly. And my prediction model needs to say, you know, what, how can I predict something uh, about this uh, data set? So, you know from linear regression uh, in the classes that you've taken in linear regression that we can take two variables, put them together into a scatter plot, run a linear regression, and see if there's a relationship between the two. Well, that's a correlation matrix if it's just uh, two items. What happens, though, if I'm trying to find instead, what are the relationships whenever I have, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine different components here, nine different components that may be helpful to me in some way of, you know, making sense of this data. Well, you've seen how we can take, once again, just two items make a scatter plot, and when we make that scatter plot, draw a line through it. Well, mathematically, we can make this, we can make a three-dimensional uh, 
data set, right? To where we have an X, Y, and a Z um, axes. And we can draw lines through an X, Y, Z uh, axis to find, you know, what explains the most variance um, between those variables. Similarly, we can go all the way out to nine-dimensional space. So in a nine-dimensional space, I have this scatter plot, um, and it is in nine dimensions. Um, and then once it gets into nine dimensions, and it's hard for the brain to be able to see that much or, or to think about that much, but mathematically, I can have a nine-dimensional model, and I want to draw a line through this that best explains the most variance of the items, okay? That's what component analysis is doing. It is very similar to a linear regression because it's trying to draw one line through all of my data that explains the absolute most variance. Once I've drawn that first line, then I can go ahead and draw another line through it that explains the second most variance, and then the third, and then the fourth, and so on. That's what we're doing with, with components. Components really are nothing more than a line drawn through my data that explains variance. All right, the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna get ready to jump in and uh, do principal component analysis on our data. If you go to data mining, and in data mining, under transform, and again, I'm using solver for this. Um, you can use R, the uh, explanation is in the book if you want it. I'm using uh, solver right now. If I go to principal components, in principal components, it says, what data am I looking at? Uh, I'm looking at A1 through J26, all right? Whenever that happens, whenever you put that in, you are gonna see other variables that pop up on the left. Once you highlight them, you can click this button and move it all over so that your, your variables, variables are all selected. Again, you can't um, put country in as a selected variable. It's non-numeric. Since it's non-numeric, uh, non the uh, you know, solver doesn't know how to, to deal with that. Um, however, you can use dummy variables, okay? So dummy variables are certainly there for you to be able to, uh, to use, such as if you had males and females, you could code all of your uh, females as ones and males as zero, turn them into uh, a, you know, a numeric. So that's easy to do. Or if you had three different categories, um, like arts and sciences, business uh, and uh, economics, um, and uh, a uh, social sciences as your three different categories of stuff that you're looking at, you can code one of those as one, the other one is two, and the last one is three. So once again, if you're using principal component analysis, if you want to include the variable, you have to make it numeric. Once I've made it numeric, I'm gonna click next. In this, the um, principal component analysis says, if I want to explain this, I can go up to nine different variables, uh, nine different components. Nine different components really is the total number of variables that you have. So it's saying that there's no strong relationship between two of these items um, to try to reduce it. Because once again, what you know, you, you know from other discussions that we've had about with models, a model that is able to take and uh, reduce the number of overall components becomes an easier model to explain usually. Uh, in this case, if I could take all nine of these variables and reduce it to something else uh, that makes sense, then it's an easier model for me to be able to, uh, to explain to the boss. All right, so I can't go above nine. Um, you can go ahead, you can also click here um, and force it to have fewer components, or you can click on smallest number of components explaining and put an amount of variance that you want in here. You can use a covariance matrix or you can use a correlation matrix. I recommend using correlation matrix because they've already, they standardized the variables for you in there. Again, fixed components, leave it at nine for now. Go ahead and use correlation matrix. Click next. Um, you can use the Q stats and uh, uh, the T squared stats in here. Um, 
probably won't mean much to you right now. So let's just go ahead and finish at this point. Okay, now we have uh, an output. Um, the output comes in and it gives me it gives me nine different components, and then it gives me factor loadings, okay? So again, factor loadings for each one of these, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. And we also can see that with component one, it explains 44% of the variation. Component two adds another 18% that takes us up to 62%, all right? So we can start to see here that each component that I add adds more variance to the explanatory power of my model. If I add all nine of the components, I can get up to 100%. However, do I really need to get to 100%? So this starts our discussion of how many components do we need to keep um, with, our, uh, with our model? So let me take this over here once again. This is just already run. One thing that you can do is look at the output here to determine the number of components that we are going to use to explain uh, this protein data set. What I have done is I have taken the PCA output, this information here, I brought it to a new tab that I call scree plot. In this, I have the eigenvalues and I have the variance. Um, eigenvalues are one way for me to take and compare each of the components together. If I look at the sum of all my eigenvalues, it's nine. Okay. Well, there are nine components. So what we've done with eigenvalues is we have taken the mathematical answer um, that we that the computer has come up with. And we have said that on average, on average, eigenvalue equals one. There are nine components. This is the total eigenvalue, which means that from a, our standpoint, anything that is one or above is above average. It has an above average weight associated with, uh, with that component. Um, so if I'm using the eigenvalues greater than one to determine how many components that I need to use in this, uh, based on our protein data, it would say I probably only need to keep three components. See, this is component one has a very large eigenvalue. Component two, 1.6. Component three, just barely above average. And component four is just barely below average. All right, another thing that I can do Again, if I use just eigenvalue above one, I would go with three components. Fourth component's just barely below that uh, level. I can also take and make what we call a scree plot. A scree plot is a, just a line chart of the component and the variance explained. All right, and you can see from this slope of this line, and the reason we call it a scree plot is if you looked at the side of a mountain, um, Mountains end up over time with the rocks that are up here that break off and they fall down. The rocks we call scree. And so if you look at a mountain, it has this um, shape where the, the rocks fall off of it. Okay, so on my scree plot, what I'm looking for is a place where there's a definite drop um, between the values. So we can kind of see explanatory, explanatory, not much going on here. And then all of a sudden, whenever I go from four to five, there's a pretty big drop here between four and five. So using this scree plot idea, um, I would be able to go in and say, hey, let's, let's look at just four components, all right? Again, I'm trying to determine how many components I need to consider and think about. This says use four using a scree plot. I could make an argument with eigenvalues that I probably should use four components here. Now the next question is, what the heck is a component? All right, so I've put an extra sheet in here now, and what you will see is component one, I'm going back to my PCA output, component one, if I take and I copy all of these, um, each of these uh, variables, 
and the loadings associated with it, okay, variables, loadings, and then I list them from, top, from the greatest in magnitude to the smallest in magnitude. And whenever I say magnitude, I'm also referring to absolute value here, okay? So again, cereals has a magnitude of 0.43, eggs has a magnitude of 0.426 dot dot dot, it just happens to be negative. And so I take in, I make um, my component, put all of the items in here, and then list them by magnitude. Same for component two. Again, component two, I take this data, bring it in here, sort it by magnitude, component three, component four. Now, what do the components tell me? Um, what we're saying now is instead of using nine different ways, again, nine because I have nine variables, instead of looking at nine different variables to look at um, my current data, I only have four different components. Component one are the countries that eat more cereal okay, and more nuts, but they don't eat as much eggs or milk. Again, the reason I said it that way is this is a positive loading. So a positive loading says they eat more cereal, they eat more nuts, they don't eat as much eggs. All right, again, countries that eat more cereals and nuts and not eggs and milk. The second group of countries that, I'm, that are in here, these countries eat more fish, fresh um, fruits and vegetables rather, starch, not as much white meat, Component three, these are countries that don't eat white meat. They don't eat the fruits and vegetables. However, they eat more fish and milk. And then the last countries that I'm looking at on here are countries that don't eat as much red milk, but they do eat the fruits and vegetables uh, and starches. Okay, so now I have a way of grouping all of my countries based on their consumption. Really important. I've gone from nine different variables to four components that I'm looking at. All right, how does that really apply? Let's go look at our PCA scores. PCA scores was an output that you got whenever you ran principal component analysis. Record number one, you can see from the loading that record number one has the highest value um, in component one, 3.49. Okay, again, I'm looking at a row level, component one, highest for record one. Let's go back and look at our data. Record one was Albania, all right? So Albania, and if I'm looking at this, Albania looks like they eat quite a bit of cereal, um, not as much fish. Let's go look at our components. Component one, they eat more cereals um, and not as much eggs. So we're like, okay, that, that makes sense. It, it looks to me like it looks to me like Albania um, is a component one type country. Let's go to another one that's a bit different. So you can see that uh, that that these are different. Um, record number eight looks like they are more of a component three country, right? It's a little bit higher uh, here. So record eight is a three. Record eight would be our number nine. That's Finland. Finland looks like uh, they are more with um, milk and cereals and, uh, and fish. Let's see what component three looks like. Component three is um, milk, fish. So again, that's what we've really done here with principal component analysis. We've taken this big data set with a bunch of variables that we don't know how to uh, work with them yet. We've let the, uh, we've let the computer just run a mathematical model uh, without any theory behind it and give us a grouping of how we can take these nine variables and drop them down into four components. That's what principal component analysis is doing for you. Um, it is unsupervised in that we didn't come up with a theory ahead of time. However, you can kind of see from this the, you know, the usefulness of using principal component analysis because it can start to take your data and break it down into very useful uh, um, components. All right. 
Thanks.